All right, if you guys are still following along, we're at the bottom of page 965 in your book. So spinal motion restriction techniques vary widely. They might include any of the following. Application of a soft cervical collar and a patient secured to the ambulance mattress. Application of a rigid cervical collar and the patient secured to the ambulance stretcher. Application of a cervical collar and the patient secured in a vacuum mattress and then placed on the stretcher. Application of a cervical collar and the patient lifted and moved to the stretcher using a scoop stretcher. After patient is moved to the stretcher, the scoop stretcher is taken out from under the patient. Application of a cervical collar and the patient lifted and moved to the stretcher using a backboard. After the patient is moved to the stretcher, they are removed from the backboard and placed directly on the stretcher mattress. Application of a cervical collar and vest type device applied to the patient for extrication from a vehicle. The patient is secured to the backboard with the vest device still in place. The backboard holding the patient is placed on the stretcher. Application of a cervical collar and the patient placed on, a, on and strapped to a long backboard. The head secured by a head stabilization device. The backboard holding the patient is then placed on the stretcher. So depending on what service and what protocols that you abide by, do what is required. Okay. During the course of your lab, we will teach you how to size and place rigid cervical collars, all right? how they can cause pressure sores, and increase in difficulty in managing an airway with a cervical collar in place. Okay. To size a cervical collar, you use your fingers that align from the bottom of the jawline to the top of the shoulder. <clears throat> Okay. Size in the rigid collar for the patient is based on the design of the device. We have a two or three different kinds here in lab that we will be happy to show you and make sure that you can understand how to use all three. Keep in mind the patient, the current spinal motion restriction protocols, the real purpose of the cervical collar is simply to remind the patient not to move his or her neck. It does not guarantee the patient's neck cannot move. Therefore, just because a C-collar is in place does not mean that you can release manual spinal motion restriction. Okay. Because many hazards listed for rigid cervical collars, the soft cervical collar is a viable alternative. Collar application of a cervical collar can create an unnatural separation of the spine by as much as 11.3 millimeters. This is enough to cause a secondary spinal injury, so making sure that it is applied correctly is crucial. If it's not fitted properly, placement of a cervical collar might lead to a greater movement of the head and neck. Okay. Making sure that a collar can cause a cervical collar can cause separation of C1 and C2 while stretching the spinal cord. Okay, you need to make sure that you slide the the C collar under the back of the neck. Do not lift the head at all when you're trying to slide a C collar under a patient that is supine. Cervical collar itself can produce pain and discomfort. Reassure your patient that it is there for their protection to try to make sure that they have a less chance of becoming paralyzed if the mechanism fits. A cervical collar can increase intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure is increased even more when the patient is placed supine and a backboard is applied. This could be detrimental for a patient with head injury. Historically, the standard device used to restrict movement of the entire spinal column was the long rigid blackboard. Although backboards can be can have many harmful effects, some EMS systems continue to allow their use as part of a spinal motion restriction protocol. Hazards and harmful effects of securing and transporting a patient on a rigid longboard can include, or I'm sorry, patients in a supine position who receives spinal motion restriction as a result of a backboard cannot control their own airway and are prone to aspiration of gastric contents if they vomit. The straps that are tightened across the patient's chest have a restrictive effect on breathing by interfering with the mechanics of breathing. 
The rigid board can cause pain in patients who had no pain before being secured to the backboard. Existing pain can be worsened when the patient is placed on that blackboard. Backboards are commonly stored in outside ambulance compartments, making them extremely cold, which can lead the patient to become hypothermic. Even if the temperature of the station bay, say for instance, is commonly only 68 to 70 degrees, placing an exposed trauma patient on a 68 to 70 degree device or colder backboard can allow the patient's body to lose heat through the board. This can cause a reduction in the patient's body core temperature. In the trauma patient who is bleeding, that's not really a good idea. Okay? Pressure sores can occur from being secured to the rigid board for too long. One study found pressure sores develop begin soon after the patient is placed on the board and before their arrival at the hospital. So patients who are placed supine in the back of the ambulance are more likely to experience motion sickness in a moving ambulance, which increases their risk of aspiration. Current research has shown that more manipulation can occur when applying and using these devices as compared to having patients simply extricate themselves from the vehicle while maintaining their own self-restriction of their head and neck. The EMS crew can instead remove the patient using a rapid extrication or a rollout technique. Straps or cravats are placed to keep the patient from sliding up and down laterally on the board. Deceleration straps are another important adjunct to securing the patient. These straps are fastened across the patient's shoulders. Instruct the patient to hold his head in the neutral inline position and not to move it when approaching in the patient. Do so from directly in front of them so that they remain focused. Okay. Immediately instruct the patient as you approach them to bring their head and neck in an inline position by lining up their nose with their umbilicus and not to bend, rotate, extend, or flex their head or neck. They should bring their feet and toes together in line with the umbilicus and the nose. Okay. Assess the patient for pain. Determine if the patient has any tenderness or if you feel any abnormality to the bony structures and assess motor sensory function. Okay, pulse motor sensory functions in upper and lower extremities. Have the patient maintain self-restriction and continue to look forward with their arms at their sides. Test motor sensory function. Okay, the patient should be instructed to relax and allow to freely move if they meet the following criteria. Patient is reliable. Again, GCS of 15, no distracting injuries. Can communicate no intoxication or drugs. And make sure you can clear the spine. Sit back on the stretcher, have the patient lift their legs onto the stretcher, have the patient lie back, and secure the patient to the stretcher. Okay? These particular patients I mentioned, we don't need to strap these patients to a board. Okay? Make sure you explain to them to remain in a supine position and to constantly maintain self-restriction until instructed otherwise at the hospital. Okay? When you find them supine, Okay, or prone, a patient with a suspected spinal injury, first ensure that all life-threatening situations have been managed. This move is ideally performed by the least four rescuers to do it appropriately. One rescuer at the patient's head directs the movement and maintains inline stabilization of the spine, while the other three rescuers move the patient onto the board. Position the board under the patient by sliding the board under the patient during the log roll, then place the patient on the board. At the command of the rescuer, maintain inline stabilization. Use slide, proper lift log roll, or scoop stretcher to position the patient on the backboard so that the movement is as limited as possible. Place padding in the spaces between the patient and the board in an adult pad under the head and torso taking care to avoid extra movement in an infant or child up to approximately eight years of age pad under the shoulders. Secure the torso and head to the board with straps. The strap across the chest should be tight enough to prevent shifting of the torso, but not so tight that it inhibits the movement of the chest muscles and impairs breathing. The patient might be able to self restrict if they are alert and can obey commands. Secure the patient to the stretcher mattress if that is the case. Instruct the patient to maintain constant self-restriction and rotate 180 degrees until the back faces the stretcher. Okay? Have the patient EMT, I'm sorry, have the second EMT who should 
now be positioned on the opposite side of the stretcher as the patient prevent the stretcher from moving and guide the patient back onto their mattress. Instruct them to maintain, rotate, maintain restriction and rotate 180 degrees until his back faces the stretcher. All right. Secure with seat belts and just keep reminding them during the trip to the hospital to maintain, just keep their cells still. For a KED device or what we call a vest type, all right, assess pulse motor function before and after applying this device. And this is a device that we will go over in lab. Use manual inline stabilization and apply a C collar. Assess pulse motor sensory. Position a short device behind the patient. Be careful that the EMT is holding inline spinal stabilization does not move excessively or move the patient to the device positioned. You should slide the board behind the patient as far as into the seat as you can. The top of the board should be level with the top of the patient's head. Okay? And the bottom of the board should not extend past the coccyx. The body flap should fit snugly under the patient's armpits. Secure the device to the patient's torso. Make sure the straps are tight enough to prevent movement but not to impede breathing. If the device has straps that encircle the legs, apply these straps Okay, after the chest straps are applied. Pad behind the patient's head to ensure neutral inline position of the head and neck with the rest of the spine and secure the patient's head to the device. Maintain manual inline stabilization even though the head is secured to the device. Securing the head is the last step in the application of the KED. Tie the hands together and pivot the patient onto the long backboard while maintaining manual inline stabilization. Position the board under the under or next to the patient's butt and rotate them until their back is in line with the backboard. Okay? Release manual inline stabilization only when the patient is completely secured. Assess pulse motor sensory and record findings on the pre-hospital care report. Release the leg strap so the legs can be laid flat on the board. Okay, rapid extrication is permitted when the scene is not safe, when the patient is unstable and needs to be moved and transported immediately, or the patient blocks your access to a second, more seriously injured patient. If rapid extrication is needed, the patient is brought into alignment with manual inline stabilization and cervical collar is applied. A long backboard is positioned next to the patient. The rapid extrication technique requires EMTs to improvise at the scene. Patient is quickly transferred to a long board while manual inline stabilization is maintained. The rapid extrication technique requires EMTs to improvise at the scene base at the time of car and location of the roof support posts. If time, resources, and patient condition permits, removing the roof can enable better access to the patient and easier removal using the rapid extrication technique. Thorough assessment of a patient is difficult under any circumstance, and the presence of a helmet makes these tasks even more difficult. But the removal of a helmet should not be an automatic step because such removal could risk aggravating a spinal injury. Thorough assessment of a patient is difficult, so you have to make sure that any obstacles that are in your place that you try to overcome those to risk aggravating any additional injuries. The removal of a helmet should not be an automatic step, all right? But we're going to go over the steps on how to do that. We need to worry about does it fit well? Does it interfere with the patient's ability to breathe or us to be able to manage their airway? Or is the patient possibly in cardiac arrest? The techniques for the removal of the motorcycle and sports helmets follow this slide. Okay. Take the patient's eyeglasses off before you attempt to remove the helmet. One rescuer should stabilize the helmet by placing hands on each side of the helmet with fingers on the mandible lower jaw to prevent movement. A second rescuer should loosen the chin strap and place one hand anteriorly on the mandible at the angle of the jaw and the other hand at the back of the head. The rescuer holding the helmet should pull the slides, I'm sorry, pull the sides of the helmet apart, gently slip the helmet halfway off the patient's head and then stop. Allow the second rescuer to grab manual stabilization of the neck Okay, sliding their hand under the patient's head to keep the head from falling back after the helmet is completely removed. The first rescuer should remove the helmet completely at this point. 
The patient should then receive spinal motion restriction like normal using a C-collar being properly sized. Recommendations now state that when appropriate, helmets and shoulder pads should be removed before transport of an athlete with a suspected cervical spinal cord injury. The rationale for equipment removal is due to advances in sporting equipment technology, and removing this equipment expedites the athlete's care. Another reason why this equipment should be removed before transport is that The EMT often have more experience with equipment removal than other medical team members or hospital and emergency department staff. When all equipment has been removed, a cervical collar should be applied. Following the application of the cervical collar, the athlete should be lifted onto a long spine board. Car seats involved in crashes might have lost the integrity of the structure of the car seat and might not provide protection for the child if another crash were to occur transfer the child to a backboard. If a child is less than eight years of age, if any mechanism of injury suggests possible spinal injury, it is prudent to provide spinal motion restriction appropriate for the young child. Make sure the cervical collar fits properly before applying it to an infant or child. Okay, Child or infant C collars do exist, so make sure you're using the appropriate size. If you don't have a collar that fits, stabilize the neck with a rolled towel Tape the towel to the backboard and manually support the patient's head in a neutral inline position. Once you've removed the seat belts and you've placed a seat collar on the patient, you want to tilt the car seat back and have it in line with a papoose or a child long, a child size long spine board and simply on the head person's count, slide the child out of the car seat directly onto the board or the device you're using to secure the spine. When treating infants or children, please use a rigid board or device appropriate for the child's size. Make sure that it fits particularly for the patient. Use padding behind the shoulders and upper back to eliminate flexion or maintain in, in line stabilization of the head, neck, and spine. The pediatric patient's torso and lower extremities need to be padded adequately to elevate them to the level of the head to achieve a neutral in line position of the neck. Stabilize the neck with a rolled towel, tape the towel to the backboard, or hold it in place with the head stabilization device. Spinal injuries can lead to permanent disability. Proper management to avoid movement of the spine is imperative. Spinal cord injuries can be partial or complete. Remember the three that we talked about, anterior cord syndrome, central cord syndrome, or Brown's cord syndrome. Spinal cord injuries can cause loss of motor and sensory function. Complications of spinal cord injury include respiratory failure and neurogenic shock depending on what level of the spinal cord injury has been damaged.